three minutes and I am the official timer. Common Core. 
four mass standards do not touch least common denominators. They delay until sixth grade the fluency in revision, eliminate convergence between fractions, decimals, and percents, and adopt the new definition of algebra as functional algebra that de-emphasizes algebraic manipulation. The English language, language arts, ELA, are also poorly represented. The common core college readiness, ELA standards, can best be described as skill sets, not fully developed standards. As such, they cannot point to readiness for a high school diploma or a four-year college coursework. Skill sets in themselves do not provide an intellectual framework for a coherent and demanding English curriculum. The Common Core document expects English teachers to spend over 50% of their reading instructional time on informational texts, not bad in themselves, in a variety of subject areas, something English or reading teachers are not trained to teach. This requirement alone makes it impossible for English teachers to construct coherent literature curriculum in the grades 6 through 12. The ELA Common Core standards will actually impair the preparation of students for competing in a global and economy. There is also a notable lack of English literature examples, thus short-circuiting the very cultural literacy that national standards ought to guarantee. The CSS, by their very existence, stifle educational innovation. They freeze what and how teachers may teach, right in place. There is not even any mechanism for grassroots correction of mistakes and inaccuracies found in the materials. But far worse, the CCS penalize original thinking. You must think as the standards demand, or you will not do well in school. China is trying to dig itself out of the results of its standardized educational system. Chinese children regurgitate their standards very well. They just don't in innovate. Ms. Dans, thank you very much. Soul, S O U L E. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you so much. First of all, I moved to Buncombe County 10 years ago, and my oldest was a uh, kindergarten. She's now in 10th grade, and I have four kids in Buncombe County Schools. It's been a phenomenal experience, and I'm a tax paying citizen of Buncombe County in the city of Asheville, and I, it's been wonderful. And I want to thank all the teachers that are here. I mean, we live in a great community with great schools. Thank you all for everything you do. But I've got two daughters that are in high school, and I've got two kids that are in elementary school. And I can't lie to you. What my kids are learning, my elementary school age kids, it's not as good as what it was when my kids are in high school and elementary. So I don't know what it is. I don't know it's common core. I know it's not the teachers that they currently have. It's not that they just have bad teachers. But there's been some kind of change, and all I can relate it to, because I'm not that involved, is that the curriculum has changed. And I believe it's the common core curriculum that's changed. So I see it. I'm involved. I'm there involved with their school work at night. I'm one of these parents that's there I'm every night, sit down with my kids and find out what they learned that day. And again, I'm thrilled. I'm glad I live here, and I appreciate everything that y'all have done. You've got a thankless job. And uh, I want to let you know that something has gone downhill in the last few years as far as I'm concerned, because I've noticed it. My two daughters that are freshmen and senior, uh, freshman, junior in high school, when they were in elementary school, they weren't learning what my two little kids in elementary school are learning today. They had regular textbooks, and they were learning the same stuff that I learned when I was their age. And what I'm seeing my little two learn today really scares me, because it's not as strong. I just don't think the curriculum is as strong. So thank you for everything you do, teachers that are here, and all of you administrators that are here. Thank you. I love living where I live. I'm not really complaining, but what I'm saying is I'm seeing a downward trend, and I know y'all want what's best for the kids, just like what I do. So just consider that as you go forward when you start talking about common core and other curriculum. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Next is George Jans. <clears throat> for which the USA is famous. The states can learn from each other and copy each other's successes and avoid their errors, and the 
entire nation going down, uh, keeping keep the entire nation from going down too is when a nation national blueprint fails. It is interesting to note that the schools that have rated the highest recently in the improvement of student achievement are charter schools, where there is competition and students flourish. Since, since parents pay for education, they should regulate education, not the educrats, the educrats in D.C. or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Because protecting parental rights is so very basic to our freedoms, and the way of life, starting with the Constitution, those rights were protected. The Constitution enumerates the powers that the federal government may exercise, dictating national standards, and education is not one of them. As recently as 2009, Congress has repeatedly stated in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act that standards and assessments are the authority of states, not the federal government. Nothing in the title shall be construed to authorize an officer or an employee of the federal government to mandate, direct, control a state, local educational agency, a school-specific instructional content, academic achievement standards or assessments, curriculum, or program instruction. The more recent American Recovery Reinvestment Act did not change this language one bit. This is the major reason people are upset about CCS. It's an illegal power grab by the federal government. It's amazing that the very persons who would throw their hands up in horror if the federal government <clears throat> messed with the minds of school children by mandating that they sing Silent Night in school are frequently the same people who feel it's perfectly okay to dictate when, what, and how children learn, and what, and how they should be assessed. This is messing with children's minds to the nth degree. If all teachers in North Carolina must teach to the test, that test determines the content of their lessons. CCS aligned lesson plans are also available on the internet for anybody who wants to look it up. The CCS is a soft federal takeover of education. It has quietly snuck in on a little cat feed covered by a fog of promises to improve children's readiness for college and teachers' ability to teach. Each family is unique. Mr. Danz, thank you, sir. Thank you. Finally, we have Kathy Rohnarmer. Can I uh, ask Mr. Chairman if um, several people have been uh, reading comments or they have prepared comments, if we could get copies of those for the board? Yeah, they're always allowed to leave those with us if they, if they choose to do so. You can leave those with Mr. Rhodes. Yes, my name is Kathy Rhodes. I'm a uh, I don't like what Common Core because it's a top-down uh, curriculum type of standard that we have. And we need to have parents and local input at every level that, that this is instituted. Uh, in, one, in one recent uh, poll, that was done, 1,700 teachers from 71 school, different school districts uh, had some uh, interesting findings on that. Teachers reported serious reservations about Common Core standards with 62% of poll teachers favoring delay or halt of Common Core uh, implementation. Uh, the Department of Public Instruction uh, has said that the size ignores the size of the federal footprint on Common Core. Let's remember a few facts. The standards were developed by the National Government Association and the Council of Chief, uh, Council of Chief State School Officers with help from an organization called Achieve and generous funding from the Gates Foundation. But even former, Mike, even former Governor Mike Huckabee, an original proponent of Common Core and a member of the government panel that worked on the original CC curriculum, stated on one of his recent programs that Common Core has morphed into something entirely different than what the original intent was when he was going to work on the project. The standard was developed behind closed doors by policymakers in Washington, D.C., not by states and grassroots organizations across the United States. Neither of the groups credited with authoring the standard had authority from the government to write the standards. Interestingly, the group credited with doing much of the heavy lifting uh, achieved incorporated D.C.-based nonprofit has been advocating for national standards for decades. 
Common Core supporters like to think that 45 to 50 percent of states choose to adopt the standard simply because they were better than existing standards in most states. It's not true. Almost everyone who participated in this debate agrees that states, states adopted Common Core standards to be eligible to compete for federal race to the top funding, not for better standards, really. Cash starved states in the, in the throes of recession were ready to do anything to get additional funding for education, including accepting acceptance of national education standards virtually side and seam. In addition to linking Common Core standards to eligibility for race to the top funds, the Obama administration also linked waivers for penalties for failing to meet goals under No Child Left Behind to the state adoption of Common Core standards. The Department of Public Instruction said North Carolina adopted CCS the legislative mandate process. That's misleading. The State Board of Education of North Carolina General Assembly adopted the standards a mere one day after they were released on June 2nd, 2010. A look back at the record shows that there was little discussion by the Board of Education. To this day, the General Assembly has not fully considered or discussed Common Core. It is, a, it is true language. It, it's, it is true language is added to legislation directing the State Board to continue implementing. Thank you, Ms. Rodarmer. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And likewise, if you'd like to leave your comments with Mr. Rhodes, he'll be glad to take those. Yeah. Mr. Rhodes, is there anyone else? No, sir. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to our reports um, about our two new intermediate schools. Board members, I would like to ask that you, we're going to have four different reports. If you will hold your questions until the end, I would appreciate it. Just uh, write them down so you don't forget. And we're going to stop, start with... Uh, Mr. Fairley, I believe. Good evening. Good evening. We've reached the project closeout phase of uh, the intermediate school projects. There's no one happier than me. <laughs> it doesn't mean that the contractor's responsibility is over yet. It, the construction phase has ended, in effect. Uh, in terms of the project status, we are seeking LEED certification. We've had back and forth with the U.S. Uh, Green Building Council, and we feel that we're, we're very close to achieving LEED status. With that, uh, not only do we get a, a recognition uh, and, and such, but there is a, an actual financial benefit, and that is that we will receive from uh, Public Service North Carolina, the, uh, the gas company, a what they call rate 127, and it's a reduced rate on purchase of natural gas that uh, once we have that certificate and show them that uh, we will receive for those both schools, which will cut our utility bills. Uh, all the work in the schools is code compliant. We received a certificate of occupancy uh, before we actually occupied the school. Uh, the building officials have walked through again and certified uh, the building to be code compliant. In the package of closeout documents, there's, there's numerous documents. The two I'm going to talk about are the uh, final change order and the final pay application. So we had a final change order that uh, withheld $589,000 from the contract price of the contractors. That was intended to cover our costs related to the delay of the opening of those schools. The contractors also agreed to upgrade the HVAC systems. Uh, they are about to install, uh, starting next week, an, an upgraded airflow monitoring system and and a uh, damper system, a high performance damper system. Uh, this will help us get better feedback and be able to adjust and tweak the, the buildings uh, in a more efficient way. Uh, we have had some issues with, in very cold temperature, we've had the, uh, the freeze protection activate on a couple of the units. And that involves us having to go out there and reset them. Uh, this, this upgraded, uh, what we call the Eptron system, a uh, sophisticated monitoring and reporting system will really tell us what exactly is going on up leading up to when these, uh, these units trip on uh, freeze protection. Fortunately, we have a, 
a very uh, efficient building in terms of insulation. They really hold the heat or uh, in the summer they hold the, the cooling very well because they have a very good building envelope. So when they do trip, uh, many times no one even knows Greg Fox in our maintenance department will get an, an alert, an automated alert, and send someone out there and reset it. So uh, when the contractor completes that work, we hope to uh, have better information and then be able to tweak it uh, as necessary to those uh, shutdowns. The contractors also agreed to uh, extended warranties on two items that uh, we've had issues with. In our exterior canopies, we've had some leaks, and uh, they have made some repairs but uh, they'll still be on the hook for those canopies to make sure that, uh, uh, that we get those issues resolved. The lighting systems are very sophisticated in these schools, a big part of why they're very energy efficient, and uh, we've had some components go out uh, on a regular basis, so the contractors agreed to warranty and to uh, replace those components or whatever else goes wrong uh, for an extended period of time. In terms of the final pay application, uh, you'll see in the documents that there'll be a list of all the work was, that was done and complete. They break it down in what they call a schedule of values. And so you can see all those the breakdowns. What that really represents is work by the subcontractors. And we've had a lot of local subcontractors on that. And the contractor, now that we've paid them, has no excuses not to pay the subcontractors, and that's an important thing. These are small local guys that um, have done good work and need to be paid. Contractor has no excuses anymore. Um, we do have an aesthetic issue at Coons. We have excessive cracking in the concrete slab. We've had structural engineer out there who's looked at it. It is purely an aesthetic issue, and in our negotiations of closeout, we have um, agreed not to uh, file a claim against that contractor for the cracking. Again, it is purely an aesthetic issue, and we've agreed to live with that. With that, I'm going to introduce our architect uh, from Architectural Design Studio, Mike Cox, and uh, he'll offer his perspective on the, uh, on the closeout. Mike? Thank you, Tim. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Baldwin. It's, um, it was the winter of 2009 when you started these projects. It was not the best of times by any measure. If you recall your, uh, your Egyptian history, it was, it was the custom, or sometimes the custom, of the Pharaoh to have both the architect and the contractor buried in the, <laughs> <laughs> in the pyramid. <laughs> As you might imagine, uh, it has been a source of some concern to both of us that this board might uh, be interested in reinstituting that <laughs> I have, in, on a less serious matter, I want to tell you a little bit about your schools. All of you know that there are mysteries built into these schools. Uh, we have, and I've been meaning to do this for some time, I have a nook for each of the first students that can tell me where the depiction of Pluto is located at their school. It's not an easy question. I'll, uh, I'll let both the principals know tomorrow. Uh, I'll call Ms. Gibbs, uh, Dr. Gibbs, Ms. Collins, and let them know that, that, that we're doing this. Whoever can get that email to me or a picture of Pluto first will uh, we'll receive a notice. We did just bring gifts. So if we go back, and, and I want to go from astronomy to, to mathematics. If we go back to November 10th, 2009, that's when your project was built. Evelyn bid for $16,400,000 on that day. Coates bid for $15,200,000 on that day. With the authorization of the board, we negotiated that week with the cooperation of the contractors a reduced cost that you would never exceed. Those projects ended up costing, Evelyn cost $15,700,000 in the end. Coates cost $15 million, I've got that wrong, $14 million. $500,000 in the end. You will never see prices like that for school construction again as a consequence of the 
structured environment that we're working in, it won't happen. I hope it never happens again. There was talk, and you all may remember this, in 2009 there was talk of postponing these buildings to some time when the economy was better, when the need was greater, when people weren't suffering as much. As a consequence of your actions in 2009, there was a boost in the economy in our area. The contractors, contractors in our area were hired. Suppliers in our area found work. Construction workers in our area and construction workers were hit very hard by the recession. Found work in your school. In one instance, and most of you won't know this, a woman, recent veteran, was hired at Evelyn. Worked for Shellco, the contractor there. She became, as a day laborer, she would go on to the end of the project and become the supervising person on the job. She was the person that I would contact any time that I wanted something done at the school. She supervised the end of your project. She's gone on and it's, uh, she's now a permanent employee of Buffalo County Schools. That was not the purpose of building these schools. In doing these schools, you reduce overcrowding at seven individual schools. You improve traffic conditions, and I know you won't believe this, but you improve traffic conditions at West Bunker Bank Intermediate Elementary School at Valley Springs Middle School. We provided new and this new energy efficient schools that uh, that are standard for the state. You raised the bar for Bunker County students, for students in Western North Carolina. And you did so at the benefit or to the benefit of the students here. We'll go back to the numbers, and, and this will make sense of why I wanted to go back to 2009. We don't have to look very far to know what would have happened if you had postponed the construction of these buildings. I can tell you tonight that your building, your Evelyn, that cost you $15,700,000, would today cost you $21,200,000. Your Coons Intermediate School, that cost you $14,500,000, would today cost you $20,600,000. That's a savings of $11.5 million because of at least two things. Because of the economy that we built these schools in and because of your decision to build them. I don't want to, I don't want to forget the fact that these are difficult projects. Of the projects I've been involved with in my career, these were the most difficult construction projects I've ever been involved with. That, I think, and I'm going to say that that is due in large part to the economic conditions under which these buildings are built. I think the contractor will tell you the same thing. It was not lost on me that my client had to do more work as a result of this. But I've got to tell you, I, I honestly believe that the reduction in cost is due in no small part to the actions of this board, the extra work that you did, the extra work of the superintendent, the extra work of Mr. Feely, the extra work of Buckley County School staff. There was great benefit achieved in, in what was done over the last four years. It gets better. Mr. Feely told you that um, we were trying to get a certificate from the Green Building Council of LEED certification. I can report to you tonight that not only will you get LEED certification from the Green Building Council, they have awarded you a silver certificate. It's called most of Wow. Most of you don't remember this, but I told you in 2008 that uh, after decades of working with the school board, this would be a legacy project for me and my company. If we go back to my earlier remarks about the Pharaoh, that did not mean that I intended to be buried in these buildings. <laughs> um, I'm very proud of what we achieved together. These are the legacies that we think we can leave on the camera. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Lord, if I can, let me review some of the closeout documents with you to make sure that uh, you understand that the closeout was in accordance with the discussions that we had about closing out these projects. I think in looking at these documents too, it's important to remember that one of the reasons 
why the final close out of the construction phase took as long as it did were issues related to mechanical systems, and that is the contractor that went bankrupt on both of these general contractors. Um, you may not know this, folks in the audience may not know this, but in modern construction, the general contractor does not swing a hammer. The general contractor has very few employees, has supervisory employees, and all of the work is done by subcontractors. And that's real important for a lot of reasons. But anytime a major subcontractor, such as the mechanical subcontractor, goes bankrupt, they have to go out, they have to then get a replacement contractor to come pick up where the bankrupt contractor left off. Not surprisingly, you don't get a good a deal for the replacement major subcontractor that you get on bid day when everyone is trying to obtain the work. So both of these contractors had to go out at significant expense. This board will remember that those discussions were going on in 2011 as to the replacement contractor they were going to get and what they were going to do. At the same time, there were controls issues that had to be worked out. So neither contractor walked off the job, neither contractor ignored the work. It just literally took this long to get all of the pieces in place for the final completion and the final payouts. Uh, but in doing so, I think it's also important to remember the buildings were supposed to be occupied for the beginning of the 11-12 school year, approximately August of 2011. They were occupied, they were taken over by Buncombe County Schools in December of 2011. And that fact, so there was about a four to five month delay in us getting into the building. That will become important when I talk about liquidated damages. But let me point out a few things to you quickly. The first is in the application for the final payment. As your architect told you, that is a wonderful document. If you want to know why are we paying the contract, it details according to the type of work that was done, exactly what the payment was made and what it was for. Isolated footings, wall concrete, slab on grade work, expansion joint work, wood blocking. It goes trade by trade so that you can see where the money goes to with each application with the final pay application. The final pay application also shows you the amount that was deducted through change orders in order to close out the project. So for example, on the Evelyn project, we're withholding from the contractor to cover our cost as a board of education caused by the delay, $267,492.63. That is also included in a change order, in the specific change order that Mr. Fairley talked about in the packet. From there, we move to the typical closeout documents, and from your legal standpoint, from the standpoint of your legal liability protecting you, from the standpoint of our office as board attorneys, these are the documents we really care about. We want you to finish in the black, and you did. We were able to finish in the black without going into the red like the contractors did. But at the same time, you got the closeout, which means, first of all, you have consent of surety. Why does that matter? The surety stands good for the work of the contractor. So if you had a contractor who had some faulty construction that you didn't discover, or you didn't know what the reason or the responsibility was until several years later, if that contractor has gone and you still have a surety to look to. And you have nationally recognized sureties that have several hundreds, probably millions of dollars in reserves for these claims that are backing both jobs. They have consented to the final payment. And in that consent of surety document, it says that they still stand good for their obligation to cover the work of the contractor. Uh, the worst thing you can do on a major construction project, and, and you only do it as a last resort, it wasn't necessary here, is kick a contractor off. Because if you do so, the surety is not obligated to agree with that. The surety is not obligated to then cover deficiencies, and the surety can fight you in court and simply refuse to pay, saying you didn't have justification for terminating the contractor. So we've got the warranties, we've got the extended warranties that Tim talked about, and some surety, so we have somebody to look to. From that, we have the next most important document, which is the final certificate and release. This document does two major things. First of all, it says that the work is completed in accordance with the plans and specifications. So if there is an issue that the board discovers, and I'll give you the most, uh, the, the, most you, the, the, the most frequent example we deal with in school construction is roofs. Uh, let me say on the record, let me be clear for the meeting, we know of no issues with the roofs on these buildings. This is by way of example. But most of the cases I've had in my career have been roof cases. Tammy's over there nodding his head. That, you would come in and then you would be able to hold the contractor speak to the fire that the roof is supposed to be built according to the plans and specs. If there's a defect, you can then do something about it. The contractor remains liable for any deviation from the plans and specifications. 
The other thing this document does is this releases the Board of Education. One of the things that your administration made very clear to the contractors, and with all due respect to Mr. Cox, he was used to this too, is the board wasn't releasing anybody of anything. We were going to close out the project, but we expected the projects to be done correctly and in accordance with plans and specs. And you have two very good buildings to be very proud of. But we have not released folks, except for a limited release I'll talk about in a minute, but the contractors released us from any possible liability. And as you can imagine, when you have a delayed opening of the school, it is not always clear. You have to remember the Board of Education has independent contracts. The architect has contracts with engineers and others. Then you've got the contractor, the subcontractor. When you get into construction litigation, everyone starts pointing the finger at everyone. The benefits here is that we're released from any possible claims that anybody on behalf of the board did anything that could have delayed the project. So we get that release. That's part of our documentation that we wanted to get from the contractor. Then on the Kuntz School, the only difference in the documents, and again I'll point out that the Kuntz documents also show the amount that was withheld from that contractor. That's $323,965.44. But in the end, the contractor agreed to be withheld from the final payment. The only difference is a limited release that was worked out between the parties there. That limited release was a few specific items um, that had come up and had been resolved and were no longer an issue. The major release that this board gave to both contractor and architect was any claims for delay and any claims that might have come forward in terms of the parties claiming that there was delay among the parties. The reason why we were able to give this release, and it includes the architect, is because the contractor cannot sue this board for delay. That's one of the things the contractor has released you from. So in turn, for us to then release the design team, their representatives from any delay claims, is easily done because you've been released at that point. So it's not like that you're going out on a limb, and it makes it very clear that you're not releasing anyone from any of the performance issues with the plans and specifications that are covered with those. Let me address, finally, the liquidated damages question, one of my all-time favorites, and you'll have to forgive me for doing a little education Construction Law 101 here. The liquidated damages is probably one of the most misunderstood concepts in all of construction law. You start with the fact that liquidated damages are there because trying to decide how much an owner is damaged for each day a project is late can be very difficult to quantify. So the law allows you to set a numerical amount that will cover those damages that you suffer in case of delay. Like most things in the law, though, it is not black and white. It doesn't say that whatever number you set, that you set will be upheld by the court. Liquidated damages only cover delay until you have substantial completion. The statutes define substantial completion as being able to occupy the building and use it for its intended purposes. We all the time, in construction contracts, to your benefit, push the envelope on that standard. And in these contracts, your architect had a standard in there that there had to be confirmation of several of the HVAC components before there could be substantial completion. So we took the position throughout that there would be a slightly later date of substantial completion than occupancy. There is no guarantee that a court or a judge would have upheld that. Again, liquidated damages are to cover that delay that you may have. The other principle that is black and, that is black and white is liquidated damages cannot be a penalty. So if we agree with the contractor that the liquidated damages will be $10,000 a day for every day we can't get into the building, the courts are free to strike that down as a penalty and not uphold it. Because again, it's just supposed to cover your damages. No one is supposed to receive a windfall simply because a building is left. The premise of contract law that relates to the liquidated damages. So again, why do you have liquidated damages? It's to cover your damages. What are your damages as a board of education? Fascinating question, because as a business owner, if I plan to move into a new building and start my operations, and I can't, I have some very real damages. I may have lost contracts. I may have to acquire alternative space. Uh, there may be real damages that relate at that point. The damages we suffer as a school system are not as clear. We were able to keep the children in their home schools. We did not have to move. We could, you know, we could keep the students in their home schools 
There was no alternative provisions that we had to uh, provide for. We didn't have to rent space. We didn't lose any profits. We continued to educate like we all had. We were just delayed in getting the students to move in. So what were our damages? Our damages were the increased cost to the board of the delay in completing the projects, in getting additional architects, engineer fees, in storage costs, in some retests, and some other things. So when it came time to close out these projects, what we looked at was the actual damages suffered by the board, again, so that you could finish the projects in the black, instead of First of all, I will make no guarantees, nor will I ever give percentages on anything like liquidated damages, because it is up to the courts, it's up to the specific facts, who caused delays, what they were related to, whether or not there's a penalty. But it's fascinating to me how this turned out. If you take the number of days that we were delayed in occupying the building, and then you give the contractors, there was an issue, if you'll remember, with the monitors that let the light in on the top of the building. If you give them 18 days, which our architect had said that that was a reasonable amount of time in which they had to retool to adjust to that. If you give them the benefit of that 18 days, they were approximately 130 days late in us getting into the building, which again is the statutory standard. 130 times $2,000 a day is $260,000. So I, had you gone to court, had you tried to collect liquidated damages, uh, I don't know that you would have come out any better than you are now as far as the liquidated damages provision. And again, that only covers the substantial completion. Now certainly we would have argued for more had we needed to go to court, and guess what? The contractor would have for a whole lot less. The contractor also, they were prepared to argue that the delays that they suffered were not at their end making all of them and that they suffered additional damages, they would have brought those forward as well. So again, the, the liquidated damages issue is what people often bring up. Uh, but in this case, what you chose to pursue were your actual damages so you could finish the projects that were in the black at that time. So it, it, it worked out pretty good as far as the numbers and the relationship between the numbers. Dr. Baldwin? I think I'm either bad cleanup or I'm supposed to close out to close out. Uh, you know, Mike talked about when we began the construction of these two projects, and soon here uh, he said it was the best of times. It sort of reminds me of the famous Dickens quote in the tale, I think it's the tale of two cities. Uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And it was the best of times in terms of for us, because I think Mike's exactly right. Had we decided to delay and build these two projects, these two schools, any time within the current time period, you know, he estimated a, a savings of around $11 million. So we did take advantage of, of what I would call the Great Recession at, at that point. It was also the worst of times for the construction business, and uh, having a, a son that's uh, in the construction business, I, I can certainly relate personally to that and hearing his, his stories the companies he, he worked with during that time. Um, I think I'm correct, uh, Tim, that uh, Malou Blaney, the uh, contractor GC on the Coombs site, I think they lost over that tier, uh, time period 10 subcontractors. And the con and construction terminology, I would say that those 10 subcontractors went belly up. Bottom line is they went out of business. So as Chris pointed out, it, it's time, and it's transition time. But it's money that cost the general contractors. Um, Shellco, I'm not sure, but I do know that there were multiple subcontractors in well, as well. In fact, they shared a number of those subcontractors on, si on both sides. And I know they also suffered number of those uh, uh, subcontractors. Southern Mechanical, uh, Chris mentioned, that was HVAC, which is huge. Uh, I know in, in my experiences as a principal on construction sites, uh, losing them was significant. But again, it was cost uh, to those GCs. Uh, the subcontractors, uh, you're exactly right, majority of them were local. 
and um, uh, I know Mr. Fairley uh, probably had some sleepless nights because his phone would ring off the hook over this period of time because these, these are local partners, many of them parents with kids in our school system that weren't being paid. So I'm very positive of these closeouts, they're going to have checks. Um, let, me, let me leave you with three, three thoughts. First and foremost, my charge as superintendent of this board undertaking these two projects is I make sure I bring them back to you completed in the black that we stayed within budget. Uh, there, were, there were times I was over at Mr. Campbell's office and I was sweating bullets, but we brought, brought them in under the line. Uh, second, uh, do not underestimate what Mr. Campbell said, which is the contractors, both contractors, and their bonding companies remain liable for work. That's absolutely critical. I can tell you as a principal of Reynolds High School, having gone through construction projects, uh, major construction projects, very important. And then finally, bottom line of it, the Irwin community, the Robertson community, and Buncombe County Schools are left with two school buildings. They are models for the state. And we didn't know it until night. Mike kept this from us. But both of those buildings receiving silver lead certification is incredible. Because we put that as a, as a priority. We wanted those buildings again and symbolically for this generation of students and future generations that are going to occupy those buildings. So uh, I would invite the public, if you've not had the opportunity, to, um, uh, to visit those campuses and those school buildings, please do so because they truly are models of, uh, of what makes Bunker County Schools so special in the state of North Carolina. That closes my closeout comment. Okay. <laughs> Board, um, at this time, if you have uh, any comments or if you have questions of any of the four presenters, uh, feel free to do so at this time. Uh, Mr. Bryant. I, I have one quick question. Well, I'm not sure who would answer the, the surety policy. How long is a surety policy? How long is that good for? What's the duration of time? And, and is the surety policy that we've gotten on both these schools standard for the industry in terms of whatever that time is? Yes, the, um, the surety basically stands. The question is, for those who didn't hear it, is how long is the surety's obligation? The surety's obligation by law is the same amount of time as the contract. Uh, they, the law uses the phrase, they step into the shoes of the contractor to guarantee the job. What North Carolina law provides is that from substantial completion, and that's where the statute says you can occupy the building for your intended uses. So for us, that would be, we would need to use December, you know, October, November, December, that time frame of 2011 is our substantial completion date. You cannot sue after six years in North Carolina on damages. You can sue for warranties, you can sue for warranties beyond six years, but you cannot sue for damages beyond six years. That's just public policy. Years and years and years ago, the construction industry and others lobbied the General Assembly and there's a six year statute of limitations. Within that, for non-public entities, there's even a floating three years from when you know you have a problem and you know who's liable for that problem. So one of the things that Mr. Fairley knows is that our office does not like to go beyond three years from when we knew about a potential issue with any construction. And then, of course, we're going to be looking at that 2017 date as the absolute outside and make sure that if there are any issues that we can address. So the short answer to the question is roughly December 2017 would be the outside time frame that we would always want to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, I just wanted to clarify, you said that we did not collect any liquidated damages. Uh, is that correct? <clears throat> yes, again, what the, the liquidated damages, you would withhold those uh, from the contract amount is what the board would have done had the board chosen to keep liquidated damages. We never got down to assessment of the penny what we thought you should withhold or what we thought that that amount should be because the board chose to go with the actual damage calculation. And again, just to be clear, I like the lead silver, I didn't notice today until I was looking at it. It was kind of uncanny to me 
than 130 days, which is a very likely outcome, had we all had to go to trial, that would have been 260,000. Well, we withheld 585 on both jobs, so you know, feel pretty good about that. But you did not withhold liquidated damages because you chose to withhold actual damages. That was through an agreement with the contractor. And the other issue, and in fact, Ms. Baldwin, I think you had asked about the subcontractors, that, or at least one that had contacted you. If we, if we withhold an amount of money for liquidated damages that goes beyond our actual damages, we're penalizing the contractor, but we're also penalizing the subcontractors. Because the contractor's not going to pay the subs until the contractor's been paid by us. So there's kind of a, a good faith public policy issue, too, anytime you're looking. It, just because you can withhold more in liquidated damages than what you actually suffered, there's a real question of should you from a policy standpoint because you're only hurting local subs uh, in your area. And I think we, we have some discussion about that. So the actual damages, is that actually, um, is there a list of what is included in that? There is, yes, there is a list and the majority of that is additional engineering fees related to working out the mechanical system a lion's share of it. Then there were some storage fees. We had to store equipment, Ms. Baldwin, since we couldn't move in right away. And then I think, Mr. Curley, we had to do an air test over again. And there were some other fees. And we do have those fees, which can be provided if you like. Board members, any other questions? I had a question about the commissioning agent. Um, there was a hearing company to make sure that the mechanical systems were working properly and that's why there was the recommendation of adding the Eptron and, and those sort of things. Um, has that commissioning agent signed off on the HVAC systems yet? Yes, part of the several layers there. First of all, the commissioning agents work with us is ongoing. The Eptrons are actually going to be installed and the hope is that they are in by Christmas Eve at both schools. That is ongoing as we speak. Had to be coordinated with the subcontractors and everyone else. The commissioning agent will actually come back after that's done with the dust and balance agent to do some additional tweaking. Part of the lead certification is that the commissioning agent had, and I'm getting a little outside of my uh, you know, my, my competence, but Mr. Fairley can jump up if I say this wrong. The commissioning agent had to certify that the system was within the plans and specs for us to be able to submit it to lead. So the commissioning agent did certify that it was in plans and specs. Things that passed code, uh, North Carolina building code was met. Submission was made to lead, and then as you've heard tonight, you got the lead schedule. So yes, the commissioning agent was part of the sign off on the HVAC system, making sure it met plans and specs, and submitting it to lead. And the commissioning agent's not done until after we get the electrons and stuff. Going going back to the lead certification, we we were only really applying for the standard lead certification at the beginning of the project, correct? And so to we kind of have a little bit of an upgrade there that we had to plan. Did upgrade. Um, it was always a goal. We were always trying for silver. We never thought we could get it. Uh, but you put the facts before the Green Building Council and they made the decision. Uh, they, they decided to award silver. It wasn't that. Thank you. Ms. Baldwin, you got another question? There are plan B at this Eptron system and the Denver uh, systems. If they don't work, to, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, um, and there needs to be something further done, who will be responsible for paying for that? The Back to the first point that everyone still remains on the hook. So legally speaking, contractor, subcontractor, supplier, architect, design team are all responsible for the performance of particular components. The trick in any situation is, first of all, troubleshooting and trying to correct it in a way that you can successfully do that. And if not, then liability, that's where you would look. And, and that requires further evaluation experts. But all, all of those parties remain potentially liable for any construction issue on any construction project. And that includes the, the daylight monitors and the roof, as far as the roof might is that under a roof warranty or? It's, yes. The, we have a roof warranty that takes, and Mike, tell me if I'm mistaken, this. We have roof warranties that take into account the penetrations in the building. Construction is always, and construction law is very complicated. The question, if you have a leak, becomes 
is it due to the fault of the roofing contractor or is it a defect in the monitors themselves that may have been subbed out to a metal fabricator, metal fabricator or some other subcontractor. So there is always a, a, a review and an analysis of which trade may be responsible. So just because there's a roof leak doesn't necessarily mean it's the roofer, but that's always one of the first places you look. I have another question for Mr. Fearley. Okay. Um, uh, in the past, I've inquired about testing in those two uh, intermediate schools due to the classrooms on the basement level, and because this area is uh, known for having radon gas, uh, which is a, the second leading cause of uh, lung cancer in the United States. Um, those tests are supposed to be conducted over spring breaks or, uh, or the summertime. If you've gotten any results from that, the, the tests were never conducted because we have had this ongoing work on the mechanical mm -hmm. system, and in order to do the radon testing, there needs to be an extended period of time. Is totally 100% unoccupied. We haven't been able to find that window to do that testing, but we have uh, the protocol. We have the folks on board and hopefully uh, this summer we'll be able to do it because all the work will be done. We're in a shutdown period of time, so that's that's the goal. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Mr. Chairman, I, yes. I don't really have a um, question. I just want to make a comment. If I Go right ahead. Um, and I, I'm speaking actually more as a mom. Um, but I guess still as a representative um, in the Robertson District. Um, I want to just thank Mr. Cox, Mr. Mr. Campbell, for all the hard work that you've done to get us to this point. Um, I was one of those very frustrated moms over the situation. My daughter um, was one of the students that was delayed in entering, and it was a very rough road. Um, but as I was told, that students are much more resilient than their parents. I found that to be true. Um, and she had um, a wonderful experience for her year and a half at Pence and um, did indeed enjoy the building. I'm going to have to ask her if she knows where the picture of Pluto is. However, she's moved on, so she will be disqualified. But um, Again, I just wanted to let you know as a parent um, how much I appreciate all the extra work that you guys put into getting us where we are now. And I can truly say that I am very proud of Penn's Intermediate and um, Evelyn, although I, being that I haven't been out to actually visit Evelyn yet, I have to do a board exchange program. Um, we can make that happen. Yeah, I'll wear it. Um, yeah, you know, I just wanted, I wanted to just let you know that I, I haven't had the opportunity to let you know that also, uh, we've, there are some other rebates that may possibly come back to us in the form of uh, some, some state money and maybe some other uh, areas. So there may be some additional monies that we, that we get back on these projects down the road. And we'll try to let the public know also. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. I also would like to thank the people that have worked so hard to make this happen. It, it um, has been interesting to watch as... Um, a plan was developed and sabotaged by rain or mudslides or whatever else you would like to list. But this was a, a picture of how a team should work and uh, work for the goal of making a wonderful place for our students to go to school and have a safe and, and um, pleasant building to learn in. And I want to thank all of you. And I, sorry, I did have two more questions for Mr. Fieldley. Okay. Um, as far as the irrigation system, those silos to collect rainwater, um, I know we had a lot of rain uh, this past summer, and um, has that system been able to function properly? Remember, we have uh, two systems at each school. One uh, collection system off of the gym feeds a uh, 5,000 gallon rainwater collection cistern. And it has a very high 
Tech delivery system. You hook a hose to it, you open the valve, and the, the head pressure feeds the, <laughs> the water out. And that basically is in the garden area. Uh, Mike Cox has uh, labeled it the farm. So for the school garden and such, it's a very hands-on. You see the water pouring off of the roof. And then the other system, is the, the, uh, it's, been, it's been called the silo. It's a very large, uh, a large collection. It's 55,000 gallons. And uh, our departments have looked at it that they would really love to tap into that. But what that does, it, it does those cisterns do a couple of things. And, and they provided us lead points. Not only do they provide irrigation capabilities, but what they do are big buffers for storm water. So when the rain comes off the roof, instead of rushing right to the storm water system that everyone else is doing and, and perhaps overtaxing it, this is our big buffers. So we have to remember that that's another purpose of it. The big, uh, the big cisterns tie into an irrigation piping that goes to the playing fields. And uh, our hope is that someday a uh, benevolent user of, the, of those playing fields will uh, be able to tap into that and put a, a real irrigation system. Right now, those systems are, do a similar thing. They, uh, at Ablin, they feed the two fields, and if you put a, um, uh, basically above ground, right, like we would use at our home, you can, you can irrigate those fields. But until in a, in a below ground automatic system goes in, uh, they'll only be used for, uh, if we hit, hit a drought or something like that. Um, at Coons, however, we have irrigation systems on the, the baseball field and the soccer field at, uh, at Estes. And that is a, a real legitimate uh, uh, irrigation system and what this what the uh, cisterns do at Coons is feed that system so that uh, we can utilize that water on, until it runs out and then we use city water after that so that's how they're operating and, um, so I so they're really pretty low tech. It's mainly gravity fed. They really are, yeah. 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 Oh, the carpet. Uh, I know, I don't know if it was just for aesthetic reasons, cracking uh, at Coons, that the, we did put carpet down, I believe you had told us. No, we, we haven't places. put carpet down. Okay. That's something that we can that we we considered that we, with some of the extra monies that we have left over, that's something that we may look at doing uh, okay. once we find out exactly what all these rebates are and how much we have. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be something we look at the, the schools and, and see if that's something they want to do. So, okay. yeah, but no, they haven't, they haven't been done yet. Yeah, and um, just to get a perspective on the timeline for the English school, um, has there been any uh, activity towards uh, building? No, all we've done is stabilize the sites per the agreement with the uh, with the seller, we had uh, an engineer look at it and work with them, and they have stabilized the, the site by planting grass, changing grades, putting in riprap and stone and such. So we just didn't want to be in a liability situation where we had erosion. So that's all we've done, and there's been no further uh, action. Was that paid for by the school system or the, con or the um seller? And that may be something that we look at after the, the first of the year. Thank you, folks. We appreciate the reports. And so, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, yeah, we'll take a, a quick uh, 20 after. Let's let's get started back at uh, 20 after. 20 after by that clock. My computer, my computer <laughs> yeah. Says yeah, we'll go by that clock. So se seven minutes. <laughs> Honey, you alright? Yeah. 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 Yeah.